very own Mr. Jerry Lorenzo, the founder and owner of the Fear of God. And I hope that you all recognize that I have on one of the essential pieces. It looks good on me, thank you so very much. So what I'd like to do at this time is to bring up our very own SGA Vice President, Mr. Jeffrey Francis, and he is going to give us a welcome and greetings. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Jeffrey Francis, the Vice President of the FAMU Student, uh, Student Government Association. And on behalf of the President, President Lundy Mondelez, the SGA, and the entire student body, I'm happy to bring you greetings. It is my privilege to welcome home an, an outstanding Rattler, luxury fashion designer, and founder of Fear of God, Fear of God Essentials, and Fear of God Athletics, Mr. Jerry Lorenzo. Welcome back home to the highest of the seven hills. We are honored by your return to your alma mater and look forward to your words of wisdom and nuggets of nurturing that, which, that you will share with us this evening. We are proud of what you have done, your path you are blazing for us to follow. Welcome home and thank you. And here we have Mr. Jerry Lorenzo. So before we get into the dialogue, I'm now going to ask Dr. Robinson if he will come up and do the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Black History Month conversation. This is the second in this installment, at least in this format. I have to give a great a huge shout out to our communications team led by none other than Mr. Keith Miles for organizing this this year. Uh, last year, some of you probably recall, we had another person almost in the same caliber as Jerry Lorenzo, Ms. Soledad O'Brien to kick off this series. Tonight, of course, we have the great pleasure of a great Rattler to be with us this evening. Mr. Jerry Lorenzo, who is going to talk about how FAMU helped shape uh, what is rapidly becoming the talk of the luxury fashion industry. Jerry Lorenzo Manuel is an American fashion designer and founder of Fear of God, a luxury house that comprises Fear of God, Fear of God Essentials, and Fear of God Athletics. Jerry has been renowned as an innovator, not only for his perspective as a creator of timeless luxury products, but Fear of God's ability to create on its own terms without subscribing to industry and timelines and expectations. In fact, while we were at the Los Angeles HBCU uh, Expo about a week and a half ago where over 13,000 students were trying to get access to the nation's best historical black colleges and others. It was amazing to see that number of people, most of them actually, who were wearing Fear of God essentials. Pretty impressive. Jerry was raised in Sacramento, West Palm Beach, and Chicago. He grew up with a first-hand understanding of the dynamic American landscape as his family followed, followed his father's professional baseball career across the country. During these years, he developed an appreciation for heritage through visits to antique and vintage boutiques with his, with his mother, who also made sure that their family was in church every Sunday. This cross-country, faith-filled upbringing established Lorenzo's point of view and laid the foundation for the Fear of God house and Lorenzo's singular vision. Jerry planned to follow in his father's footsteps with a career in professional sports, playing varsity baseball here at Florida A&M University. 
but equipped with his bachelor's degree from the School of Journalism and Graphic Communication, and later with an MBA from Loyola University in Chicago, uh, and being a self-taught clothing designer himself, he chose fashion and in 2013 established the now renowned Fear of God label. Founded upon an intrinsic understanding of the missing gap between the runway and the wardrobe, the brand represents a union of Lorenzo's creative vision and knowledge of the luxury space. Today, his honest and uniquely nuanced approach to fashion continues to propel fear of God into a new paradigm for contemporary American luxury. Some of his milestones include, of course, the founding of Fear of God in 2013. Uh, Fear of God and Lorenzo have partnered with brands across the industry, such as Zynga, Zignuff, Birkenstock, New Era, Nike, Adidas, and Vans, to name a few. He has collaborated on wardrobe and tour merchandise with Kanye West, Jay-Z, Justin Bieber, Janet Jackson, Kendrick Lamar, John Mayer, J Dave Chappelle, and the movie that is currently showing in theaters today, Bob Marley, One Love. Please go and see that. It's a great movie. Some of his accolades also include Wall Street Journal Magazine Fashion Innovator for 2023, GQ Fashion Awards Maverick of the Year 2023, the Hype Beast 100, 2015 through 2023, two-time men's wear designer of the year nominee by the Council of Fashion Designers of America, keynote speaker at Business of Fashion Voices 2022, and footwear news designer of the year in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Lorenzo is just another example of the fact that you can get anywhere from Florida and M University. Please join me with a warm welcome back home and an ovation for our very own Mr. Jerry Lorenzo. The process of design is different for everyone. For me, I'm a little unorthodox. Some things start from a sketch, some things start from a reference, some things start from a shape. I'm kind of chasing a feeling. Come on, man. Somebody stop playing with me, man. How does this thing make you feel? What does this thing feel like when it's just by itself? For me, I'm chasing something that is so authentic to who I am that I don't necessarily have to study it. Mr. Lorenzo. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm happy to be back. Very good, so I know you said you're happy to be back. During your time here, you played baseball. Yep. What was that like, especially with your father having played professional baseball and then shifting from that to then moving into a lot of other things before you ended up in fashion? Yeah, I think um, like a lot of students, we come with a, a preconceived notion of what, what our um, potential may be. And so when I came here playing baseball, um, you know, I you know, got into the school of journalism and I, I thought, you know, because of what my dad has done within baseball, my potential will be within Major League Baseball somehow. And so I'm gonna get a degree in journalism and hopefully work in, you know, uh, PR in the front office somewhere. Um, and so through the process of, um, of being here at school, um, through studies, through, you know, playing baseball, it's really, in that time, I didn't know it, 
but it was the way that I gave to everything that I did um, that informed everything I'm doing now. And so, you know, even my my um, senior year, um, I played baseball for three years and um, I hung it up after my junior year. But I look back and I remember being really at peace with that decision because I had given all that I could to the game to the point where I knew, you know, I can make a decision on what's next for my life. Um, and I say that to say, you know, so my senior year, you know, I was in school and then I was working at the Gap part time, at like the Tallahassee Mall back in the day. But I gave everything to that retail job. And I look back now and I remember how hard I worked on the floor. And um, at that time, my senior year, I was realizing a different gift or a gift that I had because I found out my gift wasn't baseball. <laughs> um, and so um, it just came really natural to me. But I think one of the things that I learned was you, you don't really get a chance to find that gift unless you give everything to what's in front of you. And so, um, you know, the, the, the degree is, is one of the things that you're going to take with you. But what you're really taking with you is all that you gave to, to earn that. And I think um, sometimes we get confused and we come into this opportunity with a capped potential of I'm going to get a degree and then at the very least I can get a, you know, a job with this. But that's a capped um, future when what you're really chasing is something uncapped. And you can only find that within your gift. But you can only find your gift if you go about the things in front of you um, in a way that you're giving all of you to. And I think that coming back here and, and realizing my first job in retail, the gap, and, and just putting all these pieces together, you know, I'm kind of, um, kind of speaking this um, revelation that I just got recently. So um, I hope that makes some kind of sense. Yeah, so you spoke about a gift, right, in baseball. So we have a little gift here for you, an autographed baseball cap. Thank you, thank you. And baseball from Coach Shoot. Oh, cool. Right? Thank so you, Coach. Just to commemorate your time in baseball here at FAMU. But you started talking about kind of now, retrospectively, thinking about the time or your time working at Gap, right? And the retail piece, but truly also the fashion piece. So when was it that you realized you had a true passion for fashion? Well, I left, I graduated FAM. Um, you know, it was tough to find a gig, and I thought it, it, it would be a little easier just based on my, my last name being Manuel and my dad being in baseball. Um, and wasn't really able to land something and decided to get my master's and um, went to Loyola Chicago um, to you know, study business and to, to get an MBA with the intention to, you know, be a little bit more um, attractive to, um, you know, potentially land a job somewhere. Um, and even through getting my MBA, I would, you know, I worked part time at, at Diesel, which was a, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, an upcoming fashion brand. Um, and it was, through getting my MBA and, and, and through working part-time in, in retail, um, where I was pushing myself, um, you know, to limits that I hadn't really pushed myself. You know, for me, um, I had to, I scored to get in the Master of Science Integrated uh, Marketing Communications program that was in the business program at Loyola. And if I got a 4.0, they'd move me over to, to get an MBA. Um, but I pushed myself to, you know, get that 4.0 and to get moved over into, you know, the MBA program. Um, and unfortunately, again, it's not so much of those business tools or, or subjects that I'm leaning on now with fear of God. It's the, it's the, you know, the process of, of pushing yourself beyond what you, what you think you're capable of is where you find yourself. And, um, and I truly believe, you know, um, the way you do one thing is the way you do all things. And I think it's really important that, 
you know, the, the habits that you put in place today and the way that you go about the assignments that, you know, you're getting from your professors, um, you know, you're not getting graded against, you know, your classmates, you're getting graded against your potential, you know, and, you know, are you giving everything that you can to that assignment? You know, and unfortunately, um, I can remember kind of being in those seats and potentially looking at someone that, hey, you know, are you gonna say something that can really help direct me or help guide me? But the reality is like, there's no shortcuts, you know, and, and nothing is by chance. Yes, everything is by his grace, but nothing is by chance. And the only way that you um, get somewhere is not, you know, who you know, it's do you know yourself? And you can't know yourself until you've given yourself to everything that's in front of you. Yeah, so really, really profound that you just said too, don't take shortcuts. And in everything that you've spoken about thus far, it's really about pushing yourself to the limit and giving yourself to all, whatever that happens to be, until you figure out, okay, well, that's not it. So if you think back retrospectively, what would Jerry today tell Jerry at 18 to 22? It's gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause I, you know, you know, my dad was managing and you know, I, I came here as a fresh as a freshman in '97. Um, uh, that year, my dad had just um, won the World Series with the Marlins as a bench coach, um, and then went on um, in '98 is when our family moved from West Palm to Chicago. I was going until like my sophomore junior, junior year when he got a job, you know, as, as one of the first black managers in Major League Baseball histi history managing the White Sox and I'm just, you know, a student at FAM. I'm thinking, man, I can never do that. Like, what am I gonna do with my life? You know, and so I was sitting, you know, in a, in a tough spot here, you know, and I knew that, you know, one of the things, you know, my parents had always taught me is, you know, you gotta be two times as good in whatever it is that you're doing. And so not knowing that I was going so hard with everything that I, I did, you know, even the, 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 the few times I attempted to be a, you know, part of a certain fraternity, I went really hard, you know, and um, that's just always been, you know, one of the threads, you know, that has connected the past to, um, to what I'm doing today is really how hard that I've gone against everything. And, and again, I think, you know, you're, you're not really, you're not in this, you're not going hard to be successful, you're going hard to find your gift, to find your purpose. And in your purpose is, is where you find your success, you know, and in your gift is where, where, where those things are found, but you can never really find those if you don't give yourself to the little things, you know, and you gotta give yourself to those little things in order to ever recognize when the gift is in front of you, once you start giving to it, it immediately gives back to you. And it's like all of a sudden you're, you know, you're in a dance, you're in a rhythm with something that you never expected, but you know, that, that revelation is only there because of how you've gone about everything else. So when we look at the fashion industry and kind of the traditional route that some would take to really make it to the top, You've kind of gone against the grain. Besides your grit and grind and your passion, what are some of the other things? Would it be individuals that have helped you along the way? You know, what are some of those other forces that you think have really, and you know, besides God, because we, we do know that God plays a role in that, but what do, you, what do you say are some of those other forces that have helped get you to this point today? I think my intention with fashion was I'm just trying to solve a problem. 
And I think when you're when you're trying to solve a problem, um, and you solve that problem, is when you give yourself permission to be in a space. And so at the time, um, I was throwing parties in Los Angeles. I, was, you know, started to become. I started to work for myself after I worked for the Dodgers front office for a few years and had gone back to Chicago and was um, director of marketing for a sports agency. Then I came back to LA and I started throwing parties. And, um, uh, dang, what, I lost, what was the question? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. How did you, what were some of those other forces that oh, helped you get to fashion? Yeah, so I was, um, so the kids that were coming to my parties were like streetwear designers. And back then it was just like, you know, taking a, a graphic and putting it on a hoodie. And so it was kind of, everyone would buy the same blank t-shirts, the same blank hoodies, and you would put a Supreme logo or Crooks and Castles or, you know, and these guys all had really great streetwear brands, but my vision was for something that was in between street and luxury that didn't exist. It wasn't necessarily a street, uh, a t-shirt with a graphic, but it was like, you know, the shape and fabrication mm -hmm. of that, of that t-shirt or like, um, you know, the proportion of that hoodie, not necessarily just a hoodie with a, a logo on it. And then, you know, the, the messaging may have been street, which was probably the one thing that you could tie to street and, and the approach, you know, it was just very much like a mixtape approach back in the day. It was, you know, for me, it was like, if I can get all these people to come to a party, I could easily get them to, you know, I could get them a hoodie or get them a t-shirt or, you know, if I can influence them to do something that I really don't want to be doing, I could influence them to do something, you know, beyond that. And so to your, to answer your question, it's, it's vision, you know, it's, it's, it's the vision to see what the problem is or to see what's missing from the market. And to me, that's the thing that I feel like, you know, you put that against, passion, you put that against drive, you put that against luck, you put that against all these different things, um, but it's the vision that, that directs you. And so you said about trying to solve a problem. And when I think about your line, right, and I'm wearing one of your pieces now, I would call it kind of simply luxury but I know that there are those that maybe want to categorize it or pigeonhole it into being streetwear. And I would say maybe given the birth of kind of how you came about, would you say that that's why people have categorized it that way and then have kept you in that box as opposed to moving you to Again, what I say, especially now wearing the piece, feeling it, like it's nothing street about this. In, in my humility, I would say, yeah, you know, we, we broke through, through a streetwear perspective. Um, but in my blackness, I would say it's an attempt to call me a rapper and not an artist. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, my real fight is for for us to be able to say luxury and for us to be able to not want to support black, but to inspire and be aspired to something black, where I feel like there's so many times where us as blacks will go to a European designer or a European fashion house and put something on that says luxury um, for some type of validation, but we won't do that same for, for us. And, um, which is one of the reasons that we did our first ever fashion show at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, because I was at a point where I just, not that I even would ever show in Paris, but, you know, why do we always have to go over there for validation and to, now say, hey, this is luxury, um, when all of the inspiration comes from here. And so um, my fight is to say that we could define luxury, we can define beauty, 
we can define and play in this world that we've, you know, in my opinion, been kept out of. And, um, you know, it's, and, and nothing against, you know, you know, my buddy that's passed away, Virgil was gone and, you know, done tremendous things with Louis Vuitton, but, you know, it's like, if he doesn't do that, then I can't do the bowl. And we all have different fights. I'm just convicted that like, this is my fight. And my fight is to say that um, we could do all things. And, and to me, I don't even really want to be called luxury as much as I just want to be called a new thing. You know, I, I want to be outside of your box of definition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's given us the permission to even be in this space because every time that we're doing something, it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, even in launching Essentials, I felt like the opportunity was one that, you know, H&M and Zara all felt as if they were kind of knockoffs of, of something luxury. Um, but how do you provide something that's, you know, accessible but still aspirational mm -hmm. um, and doesn't feel like it's a knockoff of something else, but just something else essential that supports the other luxury pieces in your wardrobe? And so, um, yeah, we just, we just launched Athletics the end of last year with Adidas. Um, and that seed was planted with Nike, um, you know, five or six years ago. Um, and I just feel really convicted that in order to consistently have a, a point of view in today's market that we needed to have a voice in luxury, we needed to have a voice in accessible, accessible aspiration through essentials and through performance, through sport. And to me, that's going to be the easiest thing for me to design into because, you know, I'm an athlete. That's all of my, all of my designs are informed by the swag of a, you know, the effortless swag of like an athlete, you know, and um, so that's super easy for us to pour into in sports. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that for the future. Awesome, awesome. You talked about being convicted, right? And so when I think about your conviction and the name of your brand, Fear of God, talk about how you were comfortable enough and confident enough in that as your name, your label, your mark, because some people might shy away from that. Um, in all honesty, like I knew that I could start like watching my friends have success with streetwear brands. I, you know, narcissistically saying, hey, if I dress better than you, I should be able to figure this out. But at the same time, I also thought it was kind of corny, like fashion was kind of corny. And so I needed something that that would keep me going. I needed to, I needed for it to, to have a purpose beyond just solving a solution for your closet. I needed it to be something deeper than that. Um, and so, you know, we were reading a devotion, me and my parents, about um, clouds and darkness around the kingdom of God and talking about the fear of God and how, you know, the perception of the clouds and darkness um, could really be a true fear or if you're in a relationship with him, the clouds and darkness are really just the layers to him. Um, and you can find peace in that and a reverence and a, a fear as a reverence. And so I liked um, both sides of what that meant. And it, it felt gangster enough that it um, was cool enough. Um, you know, my boy Pusha T, I put out a, a mixtape a year before called Fear of God. And so, you know, I knew it had a a name within culture that meant one thing. I knew it had a name within um, my beliefs that meant something else. Um, and I knew it had a name to, um, I knew it had a name to people that weren't aware of either one that would demand attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in talking about um, demanding attention, who would you say are your true competitors and why? I mean, I think I've just realized, like, you know, I don't really have any competitors. You know, my, my, my competition now is, you know, with my walk with God. You know, my, my competition now is, 
you know, making sure that um, my, my character is at a place that can protect the gifts that he's given me. You know, and so I, I know that the vision he's given me is the vision that he's only given me. I know he hasn't given this vision to anybody else. And so my responsibility is to be responsible to that vision. And I say that with all humility. You know, I think as soon as I start looking left and right is when I, when I get lost. You know, as soon as I start looking at the market too, 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 too deeply is when I start letting the wrong, thing, wrong things, you know, direct me. And obviously we, we have an understanding of the market which, allow, which allows us to um, create products that solve so solutions within it, um, but we can't let it direct us. And so, um, you know, I think, but even just starting, just for anyone, I think, again, that's why I started off this conversation really talking about, like, finding your gift and finding your purpose, because once you find that, there's no competition. You, you've already found what it is you've been called to do, and you just got to focus on the one that, um, that created you. You have to focus on, you know, you know, something's wrong with the product. You look to the manufacturer. You know why? Why? Why is my? Why am I designed this way? You know, and you look to the one that designed you, and that's you know. Okay, this is what I'm made to do, and that's there's no competition with that. So it's interesting because in the business world, some would call that blue ocean strategy, right? That you are not trying to compete head to head with anybody else because you're not looking left and right trying to be blindsided by them, you're looking and staying focused on what it is that you're trying to do. So I think if more people focused within and looked at the passions and the things that inspired them versus being concerned about what other people say, right? Because I think in today's time with social media and all of that, people can get so sidetracked with what others say. How does that impact yeah, I mean, you? I'm I mean, I'm 46. I just turned my comments off at the beginning of this year. You know, it's like, you know, whether good or bad, you know, I can't post a new collection and then look and say I'm, you know, driven by conviction not, and not opinion, and then I'm, I'm looking to see what you have to say. And whether it's good or bad, it's like making me feel a certain way. You know, and I think um, just, just having an awareness you know, of, of, of how much that can have an effect on you is, is key, you know, and obviously we were blessed to start a brand with the power of social media and, um, and, you know, but I believe, you know, we've kind of graduated beyond that. And if our brand even, you know, takes a hit because I'm not commenting, then so be it, you know, because as soon as I put, value into something um, where I know or I'm convicted of my values not coming from is when I'm starting to lose sight, you know, and it's easy to, you know, especially me, but I look in comments, they're all negative, you know, it's not on my page, it's always somebody hating, um, and I'm human, and those things do have an effect on me, um, and, you know, the praise has an effect on you. And when you begin to look into the wrong places for, you know, praise or anything negative, um, you're looking to the wrong places for validation. And um, then that becomes what guides you, you know, what people say or what people are reacting to. And um, you, can't, you can't let that guide you. And so you've you got to be careful with social media. So... Would that be amongst the pitfalls you would tell young people to avoid? Yeah, I think the pitfalls of social media is that it's like, you know, it's just really not real. You know, it's just not real. You know, those the, the friends aren't 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 real and the images that you see even from my campaign, you're looking at the best of 30 other images, <laughs> you know, 
you know, from someone's selfie, you're looking at the best of like a hundred that they took, you know? And so it's just like really having an understanding of kind of what it is, being able to take it for what it is, but not believing that that is like the truth of, you know, what things are. Um, and understanding that it's a tool and being able to use the tool and not let the tool use you um, is, is really important. Yeah, and so, as you said, not letting the tool use you. So in that, how do you really stay firmly planted in who you are? And how long did it take you to get to that point in your life? I mean, I think, you know, in life there's, you're constantly, I mean, you're constantly evolving. You're constantly trying to become the best version of yourself. And, you know, I was sober for like six and a half years. And then the last two years, you know, the brand started taking off and pressures came and, you know, different things came and reached back to some, some bad habits and had to reset. You know, it's a constant, you know, evolution of yourself and you think you have something beat and now you're at a different level in your life where you're, you're realizing you may not because you're, you know, you know, every decision that you make is now on a big decision, you know, and you, you've got to, you know, mature and, and, and maturate to a level where you're okay with that, mm -hmm. you know, um, if not, you're gonna, you know, um, you know, everything that you've worked so hard to, to build can, can take you out. And so you have to consistently, you know, that's why it's, again, so important now that you give to all the small things in such an integrous way that you're giving your all to. Um, and you're building your character in a way that when you get these opportunities, your character can protect you within these opportunities and within these roles. Um, because it's all, it's all so fragile, you know? It's, a, it's, it's all so fragile. And um, those are the things that really allow you to, to find peace, you know, um, in, a, in a world that can be pretty tough. Yeah, and so when you talked about finding peace, I'm sure after meeting you and your family that you find peace in your, with your family, right? But also, what kind of inspiration do you draw from your, not only your mom and your dad, but also your wife and your kids? I think the biggest inspiration I draw from my mom, my dad, and my wife and my kids is, is love. And I think, you know, we, we go so hard because we love something so hard. You know, it's not a selfish thing. You know, it's because we, you know, we, we're, we're driven by the people that we love, that we, you know, want to take care of them, want to make them happy, want to make them proud, um, want to cover them, want to provide. It's all, you know, driven by love. Um, and I think, you know, for me, you know, in that video, I'm talking about like chasing an emotion. You know, when I'm doing a campaign, you know, I'm comparing, you know, the emotion of this campaign to, you know, how did it feel when the Kappas came out on the set and like, it was just the craziest thing and, you know, mm -hmm. 98, you know, it's like there's an emotion there, you know, within this like black college experience that I can unequivocally say does not exist anywhere else, yeah. you know, and so, you know, when Outkast drops a new album and it's homecoming and, you know, two weeks later, the band, the hundred is playing a song and the crowd starts going crazy. It's like, there are some of these things that you're gonna take with you that are so influential, that are beyond, um, you know, what you're learning in school. I'm still chasing that emotion now, you know? You know, and I, I watch the band and I'm happy to see the band um, at the Louis Vuitton show in Paris and it makes me proud, but at the same time, I'm like, that's nothing compared to homecoming. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, it, you know, it's, it's just the reality, like, like the, this is the, such an essence and such a, an intangible 
and such a gift this this time and such a um, you can trust that the the more you give to this experience in your life that this is one that's just going to continue to give back to you you know and it's one that you know 24 years later is is still giving back to me yeah. you know and so um i hope that yeah yeah so you know when you talked about kind of the whole college experience and the feelings that you got and still trying to go back and recreate those I'm sure there were also people who you met right during that the, that time here on the hill and and then even after you got out who would you say are some of those people who have kind of journeyed with you from that time to now and how have they influenced right who you are and the things that you've done um, my baseball teammates, I mean, we, you know, there's, there's a few guys that I, I keep in touch with constantly, but then, you know, just, uh, like last year we hopped on a zoom, um, you know, 20 some odd years later and it was just like yesterday, you know, there's like, you know, that's like 20 cats, you know, all on a zoom, you know, it's like, you know, new year's, new year's Eve. And, you know, we're just talking like it was yesterday and, um, I guess these moments are so genuine and they're so they're so real, but you just have to be present in them to make sure you get that. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta be in it. You know, you can't scroll through college. You know, right. you gotta like every little thing. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, I've got some of my best friends. My my buddy, you know, Anthony Robinson, who played third base. You know, he just showed up this morning, you know, took the family around all day. Um, and these are just like real relationships. Um, and it's, it's these relationships that give back to you once you make it to a certain place. It's not necessarily those people that you meet up top. You know, it's those people that you grind with, um, um, that you really start to build with once you once you're in your purpose. Um, but yeah, there's this, you know, I wouldn't trade my, you know, four plus years here for anything in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you talk about even your journeying from working in retail, then throwing parties, before kind of moving into kind of the your real passion now of fashion, what would you say are some of those aha moments that helped you transition from one place to the next? Oh man, there's so many. I think once you're again, once you once you you're in your kind of purpose, it's just kind of like a dance to me with God. There's like a rhythm, you know, it's like he'll show you something and then you kind of design and create it and it's just like, and then it takes off. Um, you know, I've seen that happen through so many pieces that we've done, whether it was our track pants back in the day, a bomber, you know, hoodies back in the day or, you know, our denim. It was just like, you know, he kept giving me things that, you know, took on lives of their own. And um, so, you know, I think there's these constant moments of aha, but there's also constant moments of doubt. There's also constant moments of fear. You know, um, yeah, we, you know, I gave my last dollar to, the, to start this thing, but I also continue to give my last dollar to keep this going. You know, and we're still, you know, independent, no investors. And, you know, 10 years later, I'm still going to bet the house, you know. And so it's like, um, that's how convicted I am about this. Um, that I'm quick to put it all back into it right now because, you know, um, I'm trying to fulfill the promise that I believe, you know, I've been shown. And so... I think, honestly, we're just like getting started. So you talked about being willing to bet the house. 
You have an amazing wife who will stick by you to say, yeah, let's put that bet on that house. Let's put that bet on our life, on our kids. What does that mean to you? Oh, it's everything. Without that, like, I'm nowhere near back at fam on the stage. You know, it's just the reality. You know, it's just when we got together and, um, you know, we started a family, it was just like, I immediately was like, how do I get out of the club? How do I stop? How do I stop throwing parties and, and do something that, you know, our family can be proud of and our kids can look up to? Um, but without the, um, without that foundation, without us, you know, reaching new levels in our relationship, you know, consistently and constantly, um, you know, no, no gift is, is really like given to one person and then not, and doesn't have, you know, there's a reason that, you know, God is, you know, called on marriage to be an example of his love for the world and how he loves us. And the best example is seen through, you know, an unconditional love between two people that, um, that are not related, you know, and that's, it's a, it's a very easy thing to love your mom. It's a very easy thing to love your kids unconditionally. Um, and you know, it's very easy to love my wife, but you know, the reaching that level of unconditional love and those, you know, that's the thing that allows everything else to, to be built from. And so, um, you know, to me, family is everything. You know, and I think it was important for me to come back here with my family. Because <laughs> it's not, you know, coming back here with this business fear of God. It's, I'm a husband and I'm a father. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I want to be remembered as more than anything. So thanks cool. for asking that. No, cool beans. So um, I believe that we may have some questions that are coming on cards. Do we have cards? No? Okay, so I, we do have a couple of questions. And if you could um, make your way to the mics, we, ha we have time for a few questions that can come from the audience. So if you wanna, you know, be brave. Come on, Rattles, let's make it happen. Well, okay, all right. All right. Open so now mic. We we're we gonna see how this goes. We're gonna see how this goes. Keep it a whole band. <laughs> All right. I'm left handed, so we're gonna start over here with my left. All right, for sure. Greetings. My name is Trayvon Eugene, a third year graphic design scholar coming from Pompano Beach, Florida. So I wanna say thank you for the opportunity to be able to ask this question. As a upcoming graphic designer, photographer, and clothing brand owner, I want to say what are some of the, what are more of the challenges that you faced? starting off and not knowing where to start. Because for me, it's just a matter of building an audience, taking good pictures, knowing how to create visually appealing graphics to the FAMU community. But what were your personal challenges that you faced at your time? Um, I can't name them because there's so many. Like, there's so many more reasons to stop than there are to keep going. And, um, and you know we're in very similar backgrounds with starting a brand and the thing and, and what I'm doing now, um, but I don't know that getting into the minutia of that is as important as maybe a more simple understanding of what am I doing with this graphic gift and this brand gift, and what am I saying that is not being said. Or what am I saying that needs to be heard? And if, if you know the answer to that, then that is what will continue to push you through what some of the waves of, of, um, of difficulties that, that may be going. Like, what is it that I'm really trying to do with this? You know, and what is the real intention and vision for this brand that I'm starting? Um, and then that will start to kind of make other things make more sense for you, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does, as you were speaking about um, the self-discovery thing, because my brand is called I Am Confused, but it's spelled K-U-N-F-U-Z-D. 
but it's just about embracing the whole self-discovery while going through college, coming from a, a first-generation Haitian culture background. So as you were explaining it just now and before, I appreciate your answer, sir. Yeah. Uh, All right, so now we're over here. Uh, excuse me. Greetings. My name is Chris Miller, a uh, local fashion designer here. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you for inspiring me. Uh, thank you for the recommendation of this book. I've been reading it for some years now, <laughs> so I wanted to bring it with me. But my question is, uh, how do you deal with creator's block? And um, as far as your faith, uh, what really inspired you uh, to, to, to do some of your work pieces? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think for me, I have to always stay open to creativity. You know, my wife will, you know, I drive her crazy because I'm always watching a boring late 80s, early 90s movie, and I'm just looking for, you know, something to inspire me just in the way that they're dressed. You know, um, um, I'm always open and looking around to something that may be a reference or may be a starting point for a you know, for a collection or a piece or a conversation. Um, so I think one of the ways to kind of get over that creative block is to number one, always stay open. And then number two, once you start to find the, the places where you um, find um, inspiration is, is recognizing those, recognizing those times, recognizing those moments in the day, recognizing, you know, where you may be visiting, um, and, and, and trying to get all you can from, you know, what you know you're getting inspired by, um, but at the same time being open to something else that may, that, may feed, that may feed you creatively. And that's just me watching a dumb movie, just being, as I'm vegging out, at least I'm, you know, kind of being open to what I might see, you know? So even in times when you're just, when you want to turn it off, is there a, some type of something that you can put on that has the chance to feed you some kind of way, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. All right, now we'll come over here. Um, hello, my name is Madeline Moore. I'm a fourth year public relations senior. Uh, I'm a seamstress, I make clothes by hand. And my question for you is how do you garner standing firm in your work and your prices? Because I feel like as young black creative, especially in college, sometimes your work is not valued for what it's for. And sometimes you're maneuvered into selling your work for less and putting yourself on a small player field just because you don't have the same accolades or the same, um, the same accolades or you don't have the same backing as some people who have bigger brands. So how do you go about standing firm in your prices, your designs, and um, what you're selling? Because I make custom work. Yeah, I think um, that kind of also touches on a little bit about it's not really like who you know or what brands are attached to you. It's like, do you know yourself? And if you really know your value and you really know how much love and time that you put into those pieces, if you don't stand behind that, then no one else will stand in front of that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stand behind it. You know, and for me, um, because my stuff isn't really like logo, heavy or it's not like in your face it's really in the touch and feel and proportion and shape of it i really have to stand behind maybe digitally this you can't see the love and understand the craftsmanship and understand all that went into it but i do believe once you come in contact with it you will and um as as black creatives it's it is that fight that we have to say, let me go get validation so that I can feel like I'm worthy enough to say that this is worth this. Um, and that's a fight that we all have. That's a fight that I have. Um, and so once you know who you are and, and once you understand your value, and that's something that I had to really learn, um, that's where I found the conviction to be able to say, no, this this is what it costs. And I know the amount of work that these other creative directors put into their designs. I know it's nowhere near as much as I do. You know, I'm not only creative directing, but I'm designing every single piece and picking all the fabrics. 
And yes, it may not be what, what you think yours is, but I guarantee you the love and time and mental bandwidth and spiritual spirituality that went into this is beyond. And I'm, and I'm, I'm okay with that. And I think that's where you have to like find your peace. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's just hopefully as a, as a black designer um, and, and being uh, independent, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that I'm making it easier for you. Um, you are, thank you. And so before we go to the next question, in Dr. Robinson's intro of you, he talked about some of the artists that you worked with. Is that one of the ways that a young designer can really try to get his or her work out there is by you know, figuring out a way to get somebody famous to validate them? Or do you say just continue to hustle and grind? No, I mean, it's in the work. You know, and people can look to and say, oh, this person wore that, or this person, I saw this, and, you know, you can find an excuse for why I'm successful, but they're not looking to wear it unless the work is what the, what the work is, you know? Um, you know, I launched, you know, Fear of God prior to, you know, having the, the opportunity to work with Kanye West. You know, it was, it was the brand that he was, you know, um, attracted to, not me, <laughs> you know, and yes, it was a blessing to have those early cosigns, but if you didn't first have a point of view, then those cosigns aren't going to come. So you can't, you can't chase the cosigns until you've done the work, you know, um, and then you're, you don't want to play a game other than the game of making the best product. And you want to really, really believe that your product and your gift will make room for you, not other people's extension of your voice. That's just gonna come with your love that you put into your creativity. You know, that's a product of your, the gift into your product. But if, you, if that's the game that you're playing, then you know, that's a, that's a game I can't advise on. What's going on, Mr. L uh, Lorenzo? My name is CJ. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say, uh, as someone that can draw multiple parallels um, from baseball to Chicago, I just want to say thank you for making this tangible and like being a, uh, the embodiment of a reference point. Um, so yeah, I have a question and a, a follow-up question as well, if you don't mind. Um, so in your interview with, uh, I want to say it was, it was either Current Frost or it was somebody, I, I'm blanking on the name right now, but you said, what physical tools do I have to relieve someone of the preconceived notions there may be? And you followed up by saying, I was always trying to present myself in a way that allowed me to have a human conversation. Do you still feel as, as if this is the way a black male should go about that? Um, because as someone- No, I don't think it's the way that anyone should, I think it, it I didn't mean to cut you off, but, we all have tools as blacks that we use to, to tear down someone's preconceived notions of us before we walk into a room. It could be the way we speak. It could be us speaking differently, talking differently. Um, it could be the way we present ourselves. Um, and that was just, that was just something that, that I found that I had the ability to do that could help. I'm not saying that that's something that we should as people be concerned with, but that was just one of my mechanisms coming up as a black man in America that, hey, if I present myself a little differently, maybe I'll be looked at a little differently. And so I don't, I don't want the takeaway from that comment to, to be that we need to present ourselves a certain way. It was just a, you know, a part of, of, of my armor and being a black man and understanding what I have to get through day to day. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, you know, hopefully we 
get to that place where what we look like is the last thing we have to worry about, but that's just unfortunately something that is a real thing. You know, Trayvon Martin didn't get to wear his hood up. Yeah. You know, it's just really understanding the realities of that, you know, but um, I don't want us to think that that's, you know, um, necessary. So even, even on the come up, you don't feel as if there is a certain way you should look or speak entering these rooms initially? Or do you feel as if you should, I don't want to say hide, but maybe show a different side of you until you're I think you have at to a show, stature that you're at? I think you need to know who you are. Yeah. Once you know who you are and you show up as the best version of you, mm -hmm. whatever happens in that room is what's supposed to happen. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, then if it goes well, it goes well. If it goes bad, it goes bad. But you're at peace because you know you were you. Right. You know, and that's why I say it's like the most important thing is like knowing who you are in those rooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm in those rooms now like this, talking to whoever in a pair of sweats and a hoodie because I know who I am now. It's different. Right. You know, or before I, I wasn't, you know. So I'm, I'm sorry, I have one last follow-up question. I actually have a, a three pages of questions, so if I can maybe grab We can't get in. to all of them, but maybe yeah, you yeah. can give them to them and, you know, if you have them written out. Right. Um, so in reference to your work with Matt Kemp and then the work you did with uh, Kanye at APC, I know that was earlier on in your career. How did you enter these rooms of opportunity? Like, were you introducing yourself as, hey, I'm a designer, this is what I do, or hey, I'm a stylist, this is what I do because you, um, I was always me. Like with Matt Kemp, yeah. you know, I entered that room with, you know, a retail background. I entered that room with a, an MBA. I entered that room with working for an office for the front Dodgers doing sponsorships. I entered that room, um, director of marketing for a sports agency. And so I entered the room with Matt saying, hey, I know how I can help you with your image from fashion to marketing right. and to all these things. With Kanye West, you know, he saw, you know, my brand and I entered that room with, hey, this is my first collection. You know, he asked, why is this fabric so, so cheap? I like the shape. I'm like, because that's all I had access to, right. you know, downtown LA. And so I've never not, I've never, I've never positioned myself as anything other than me, um, but I've always been aware of how someone is seeing me, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so being conscious of that, um, but also being sure of who you are and what you're bringing to the conversation. You know, one of the first things Kanye said to me when I first meeting, it was just a white t-shirt, he was like, oh man, I could see all the thought that went into this. Yeah. And as soon as he said that, like, it was a wrap. Like, okay, we're speaking the same thing, even through this, like, white t-shirt. Right. You know, and even though I didn't have the resources at the time to put that in the best fabric or construct it at the highest level, yeah. the point of view was clear. And so um, I was convicted of the point of view that I was sharing. Okay, and that last thing, um, so. All right, Gabri yeah, so what we're gonna do is, because let me say this, this is supposed to be from six to seven, and we are just past seven, and there are 17 of you all standing up with questions, and clearly we are not gonna get to everyone. I have been told we have time for one more question, which I'm gonna come over on this side, but what I will say is, if you would write your questions down, and then we have some people sitting back in the back box right there. You if, can leave. If we have to turn off the streaming part, we can turn that off. Like, I came back here to talk to y'all, but just be respectful of, like, everyone else that's in line and, like, let's try and I want to, like, I'm here to talk to y'all. That's why I'm here. So. So we're going to keep it going. All right. Mr. Just, Let's go say we can keep it going. Just be respectful of everyone that's behind you and, just, and I'll try and be quick. Huh? <laughs> okay, Dr. Robinson said he has to leave, but we can keep it going. Okay, all good. All right, and we'll, we'll try to get him over there, Dr. Robinson. All right, go ahead, young man. 
right. Uh, greetings. I am Jonathan Charles, a second year broadcast journalism scholar from Broward County, Florida. Um, yeah. And um, I'm also an aspiring director, um, cinematographer, and writer. And my question to you was, um, you spoke about like trusting your vision, um, but during those times when you may have felt lost within it, like specifically within like what you're trying to do and what you're trying to like, you know, bring entirely to you and like draw all your attention to, um, like how did you ground yourself when you kind of got lost in that void? Because like for the first time when you enter a new space, especially like entering fashion, um, did you ever feel like you know there were just so many different things that you could get into? Like kind of grounding yourself and finding that vision for yourself and like trusting in that like what did that look like for you um i think for me i've, I've been blessed to always want to kind of say the same thing and i've always kind of known what i wanted to say and unfortunately i have learned in front of the world because i am self-taught which is you know the streetwear comment people have maybe seeing my first and second and third and fourth and fifth collections that are very far from what they're seeing now. Um, but I've always kind of seen beyond, like now and even beyond now. And it's, it's the same spirit of what I have always said, which is this you know, effortless, um, sophisticated approach to fashion that's kind of still elegant. And so, I've always known what I wanted to say. It was my craft that I needed to kind of work on. Right. And I kind of had, oh, just a, a tiny follow-up. Um, but generally, like, before entering your artistic space, um, like, what does your, like, mind look like, essentially? I know it's different for everybody, but how do, like, do you clear up that space so you can, like, fully devote attention to it? Um, again, for me, it's, like, kind of always staying open, but, and, re and now my, my life and the, the, the demands on my life are, are, are beyond just designing. It's, it's, you know, I'm responsible to run a company. We've got, you know, an office in Milan, an office in Los Angeles, um, a lot of employees, and there's a lot that I have to be responsible for, so I can't always be in a design creative space. And so, again, I have to constantly stay open, and then I have to really know those spaces where I can find you know, what I need to find to be creative, you know, and that for me is, you know, it's a lot of vintage shopping, you know, it's, I, I, I love going to, you know, all around the world and going into, you know, different vintage places and just, you know, being inspired by the smallest way of something's, how something's constructed to potentially like kind of how the garment falls. But it's, again, even in those vintage, moments I'm really open to what I might interact with or what I might see. If I go in there too dialed in with I'm looking for this specifically, I never kind of like find it. And it's really kind of finding this dance and how you stay open, um, but you're still, you know, focused on the, you know, the job at hand. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, we're going to come over here. All right, what's up, Jerry? Uh, appreciate you being here. My name is Dakari Taylor. I'm a fall 22 graduate of the Florida a and University. Um, I'm gonna try to talk quick because I do have a follow-up to my first question. Um, I'm currently working with a, a film production team by the name of New School Production. It's a production team that's made out of all FAMU students. And we're currently working on our first feature film by the name of In the Chateau. Uh, this film is pretty much gonna be depicting uh, HBCU students and the harsh realities and different things that we're still dealing with in today's reality of uh, being, you know, HBCU students, like I said. So my first question was, we did have a lookbook that we wanted you to, um, we wanted to give to you, but it got messed up on the ride over here. So I was asking, is there a point of contact in which we could get uh, maybe like a digital lookbook over to you? Oh, cool. Yeah, we can figure that out. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And then um, my question is pretty much, uh, one of my idols is Kobe Bryant, and he talked a lot about, like, um, with success, uh, a lot of things in his life had to take a backseat uh, with relationships, friendships, different things of that nature. So uh, was there anything along your ride to your success that you felt like you really, really wanted to hold on to, but it may have had uh, to take a backseat? And how do you address those things uh, and have that discernment when those things come about? Man, that's an ongoing fight. You know, the higher, the higher that God takes you, the more that you had to let go of, you know, and the more, more people don't get to come with you. 
and um, the more you have to know with who has to come with you. And um, that is just something that you're, you're kind of constantly figuring out, but you grow more and more comfortable to making those tough decisions, you know? Um, and I just recently just, you know, realized that, you know, because of where God's taken me, I just don't have the, you know, the luxury to do things that other people get to do. <laughs> you know, and then you have to make that decision. Is this where you want to go or is just, or is being able to do certain things more important to you? And I think someone like Kobe always knew where he wanted to go. And I think that's why vision is so important. If you have a vision for where you want to go, those decisions are kind of, you know, yeah, you'll struggle with some things in your life, but those decisions become clear, you know, fast. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, over here. Greetings, my name is Christian Looney, a fourth year business administration student from Tampa, Florida. Fear God is one of the most impactful brands to grace the fashion industry with its distinct colorways and oversized fit. During your appearance on Mavericks with Mav Carter, you had described a conversation you had with a kid at your church where the kid had explained how he doesn't usually feel good about himself when trying on different brands. After he tried on the Essentials or Fear of God brand t-shirt, he said that it made him feel comfortable and it felt right. I can almost say I had the same exact experience when I first tried on my first Essentials hoodie. How important would you say it is to you and your brand that your consumer feels comfortable in their piece, in your pieces? Uh, it's everything. You know, what, you know, the reason why our branding isn't so loud is because the intention is for the person to just feel good about themselves and what they're wearing. You know, and so many times, especially us as blacks have put on a proportion or a silhouette or a shape that's not really cut for our body. Right. You know, but we're uncomfortable, but we think we look good. And you really look good when you're comfortable. And so the intention for what I'm doing is how am I designing something that, you know, makes someone feel and, and, and become the best version of themselves. And with the hope that in that feeling, um, I'm creating a connection. Um, with that person um, um, beyond just maybe how cool something may look. Thank you. All right. Thanks. We'll come over here. Greetings. My name is Tyron Williams, a first year business administration scholar here from Orlando, Florida. And first and foremost, I would like to say thank you for your time. And I would like to know how many business ideas did you have before this one, if any? And what was it about this one that allowed you to separate it from the others? be confident in it and, as you said before, bet the house on it? Uh, so I've never been asked that question. Um, this was the second business, well, the third. The first business that I attempted was uh, it was called like Rhythm Sports Management, sounds corny. Um, but uh, my, my dad had got a job in Chicago and I was trying to kind of help him get like some off the field deals and I think I got him like a Lexus, like we got he went and signed, um, did a couple appearances and got a free car to drive to the ballpark back and forth. And I was like, oh, I can like, you know, represent my dad and I can kind of like create this sports management thing. And I didn't last that long. Um, but I've always had it in me to kind of want to do something for myself. I just never had the confidence that I could. And so um, I think it was really when I, you know, moved back to Los Angeles and, or, and started throwing parties. Um, and I had to, you know, I didn't have a job and so I had to provide for myself is that when I, when I started to learn, you know, um, that hey, there's this other gear that I have that I can get to. Um, and I, I knew that this wasn't what I wanted to do long term, but I really felt again, convicted that if I could do this, then I could take the same level of like focus and put it into something outside of the clubs and like, you know, at the very least be able to provide for myself. But yeah, it was the sports agency thing and then um, the sports management thing that, or, or the clubs that like call that a business if you want, but, um, and then the brand. Thank you. Over here. Greetings, I am Marco Dubach, a second year business administration scholar from LaGrange, Illinois. 
Recently, Fear of God Athletics line has been seen partnering with largely attentive athletic programs such as IU, Indiana University's basketball programs, and Miami University's respective teams as well. Um, therefore, have you and your team discussed potentially pairing with student athletes through name, image, and likeness deals? Um, it's a big thing in NCAA that's going on currently with athletes, and even HBCU sports teams in specific, and this could be in their entirety, in order to create a line of design that promotes something more significant than just sports. Um, name and likeness deals I'm not really interested in. Um, I think for me, why I see an opportunity with Fear of God in athletics is because it's not tied to um, a specific player. I think, in my opinion, and it could be wrong, but I feel like we saw, we saw what that could cap out to be with Michael Jordan, and there's been nothing since that um, that has yet to reach that level, and so I feel like the influence now needs to come outside of sport and the story has to come outside of sport, which is why I feel so strongly that Fear of God can have unca uncapped potential. Um, and yeah, it's always been my heart's desire to, you know, work specifically with FAM and HBCUs and colleges um, and beyond that, you know, reach the youth with what I'm doing through athletics. Um, even with Nike, um, you know, we gave some shoes to the basketball team. This was like five or six Years ago, we did this orange, orange and green. Um, Fear of God won, and I was really trying to get Nike to like, you know, stop looking at all these big schools and like let's invest into HBCUs and like this is where it's really at. And um, you know, I'm happy to see you guys with LeBron now, but you know, to me, it's like that didn't happen until all of a sudden social change and George Floyd and all these other things came up and. You know, I'm glad that opportunities post that, you know, for us opened up. But, um, you know, that's a conversation I've been wanting and trying to have. And, um, yes, the Indiana and Miami game tomorrow is just really just a peek at, you know, where we're heading. Um, um, you know, athletics, I know the first shoe was not fully basketball, um, but we, we've got a better team. And um, on the Adidas side, um, we've got product coming out really soon that's like pure performance I'm excited about beyond just basketball. And so athletics is going to be super focused on sports and super focused on colleges and, um, and youth programs. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll see where that goes. Stay tuned. All right. Let's go over here. Jerry, what's up, my guy? Um, like everybody else. I have an artistic pursuit. Um, I'm dropping this for my clothing brand next month. It's going to be my first drop. Um, my question is, how do you go about innovative marketing? And how do you deal with, like, not really external doubt, but really internal self-doubt and dodging, like, coping mechanisms and stuff like that? And dodging, what was that? Like, coping mechanisms. Like, just, like, dodging, um, dodging yourself. How do you cope, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um you know, my brand has reached a, a certain level based on what I've been able to do from, a, you know, um, how I see marketing. And now I'm leaning on, you know, my team to take it to the next. And so I think with anything, um, you can have visions that you have the ability to execute, but you can't grow until you bring on team members that can help amplify and, and elevate your voice and, and take it beyond what you could what you could think. And I think I'm you know I'm seeing that through the way we collaborate with like different photographers on set or different stylists or different creatives that, you know, take take this idea um, and take it to a new level. And I think um, the only way to gr grow from a marketing standpoint or creative standpoint is to surround yourself with people that can like help amplify you know what it is that you're trying to say um, in terms of coping with like self-doubt um, that's something that um, we all have and is you know unfortunately um, consistent you know but you 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 have to have faith in, in, in what you believe God has shown you to do. Um, and, um, 
you know, fortunately for me, I believe what I'm doing, um, that vision doesn't come from me. And so I, I can find peace in, in the fact that I just have to be obedient to the vision and that it doesn't rest all on my shoulders. Appreciate you, my guy. Yep. All right, over here. Uh, greetings. I am Tyler Watson, a first year graphic design scholar from Quincy, Florida. Um, I was first wanted to say thank you for, of course, coming and shedding light to all of us here um, that's going down our, you know, separate paths. Uh, the one question I did have is, as a young business owner and college student, the one obstacle I come across while running my brand is financing. Uh, starting from the ground up, what are some tips you can provide to the many young entrepreneurs that have trouble creating any revenue to push their business product? Um, again, I've just been blessed to be able to just continue to invest back in myself. Um, we've, we've, yet, we've yet to take really any substantial money, and I think um, even, even being able to, let's say, work for those funds, doing something outside of whatever your gift is, and then pouring that into your gift only really creates a a beast or confidence within you, you know, um, so that you're not seeing resources as as something that's preventing you, because then that becomes your truth. Is oh, I'm not able to do this because I don't have the dollars. Well, then you got to go do what you got to do to make the dollars. You know, it's 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 within you. And, and we can see all of these constant reasons of why not to go forward with you know, these visions that we have. But for every, for every issue, there's a solution. And in your case, I don't know exactly what that solution may be, but there's a solution for it. And, and unfortunately, just like you have to come up with the idea for what it is you're creating, you have to come up with the idea for this other problem that allows you to create this. And it's all the responsibility of a business owner. Yeah. Thank you. So when you think about that, <clears throat> Jerry, you talked about throwing the parties, right? Making the money and then investing that money back in the business. You kind of also talked about some of, you know, whether it was work in retail, but somewhere, somehow, you had to, one, figure out how to make some money to then be able to put into your business. And I think for young people, it may not all start with what you want to do, but you may have to figure out what are those other things that you can do to help you generate the dollars to then pour back into what you want to do. And the last thing you want to do at, at this stage is take anybody else's money. So the last thing you, is you want somebody else's opinion on what you're doing. Someone else is looking for a return on what they're invested. Now all of a sudden you're working to pay, to pay somebody back and you're not going after your dream with the intention of what your dream was. You know, so I, as, as hard as it may sound, it's, it's you know, it's, you, you want to stay away from that, you know, for as long as you can. Um, and, and, and find ways that you can give to the thing that you're creating. Because the more that you give to it in different ways, the more that you believe in it, the stronger that you believe in it, um, the further this thing is gonna go. And when someone does come with a checkbook, checkbook in a, to write in front of you, you, you know how much this thing is worth. You're like, no, nah, I'm cool. I put too much in this to give you a percentage of this, I can I can continue to figure this out until you get to a point where it's like, okay, I've taken this as long as far as I know that I can, and you don't you will never know that point unless you've given everything to it, which is what I was saying in the beginning. You're not going to know when you get to that point unless you're giving everything to it the whole way. If that if that makes sense, you'll know that okay I. I can't go any further unless I get this kind of help. Only because you've get, get, given all to it. But if you haven't given all to it, then you're kind of like, oh, can I figure it out? Or what should I do? And you're, you know, you're kind of left in this place of question. And so that's why, again, it's just so important that you know, this time in school, I know 
these assignments and all this stuff may not look like it has anything to do with what you want to do, but the purpose of the assignment is not what you think that assignment is. The purpose of that assignment is to, for you to find out who you are through that assignment. You know, the purpose of coming to school is you give all to this to find, to find you. And um, unfortunately, there's no other way to finding that unless you're giving all of yourself. And again, it's just no shortcuts. It's no, I know this person. Or, oh, you only, this person only made it because, you know, you know, their, per their father is this, or their, you know, they got help here, this person wore that. These are all excuses as to why you're not making it. They're not the truths. So we'll come over here. Good evening. Um, my name is April Sanders. I am a third year business administration student from Oakland, California. And I was wondering, just starting, when you were just starting out, like you know you didn't really have a name in the fashion industry yet, but what were your, what were your promotion tactics, your marketing strategy when you were just starting out? How did you get your name out there? How did you build you know, your brand? I think I built my brand through like the parties we threw in Los Angeles. You know, the parties that we threw in, in LA were kind of a first of its kind. It, you know, back in the day, it was like a black club or a white club. You know, it was hip hop or it was like, you know, techno and like white Hollywood. And we kind of found this spot in the middle, you know. Um, obviously, it was better music, but then the, you know, the, the, the mix of the, of the people, you know, you know, the, I would say the soul of the people was probably us, but maybe the mix of it transcended us, you know? Um, and we, we, we defined a, um, a party that didn't exist. And I think, um, and, and, and pushing that party and creating that party and through the way that we invited people were different, where we threw those parties were different. And I think I kind of built the reason why I go by Lorenzo actually is because I was throwing parties and I didn't want people to Google me or Google Jerry Manuel, who was my dad, who was an integrist, <laughs> you know, baseball manager that you know is not is known for not drinking and not cursing at umpires, and then is me holding up a bottle of Hennessy like, uh, so, um, and then I just started kind of branding Jerry Lorenzo and it just kind of became its own its own thing and you know a lot of people don't even know that my background is fam and that's my dad and you know the Jerry Lorenzo thing kind of took off and became a, a brand in and of itself. Thank you. All right. Over here. How you doing Miss Mr. Lorenzo? Uh, oh, my good. name is Jeremiah Coleman. I'm a second year graphic design student hailing from Chicago on the south side. My question for you is what do you attest the most to your success, like to your father? Because hailing from a past that um, I didn't have my father in my life because he passed away at a very young age, what are like some of the things that you had to learn by yourself or like some of the things that you had or the obstacles that you had to overcome like when you didn't have a person to go to or like you didn't have a parental figure to go to? What did you do personally to get you to where you are today? Man, um, you know, fortunately I did have a dad to go to, you know, and his example of how he, you know, went about baseball is exactly how I go about fashion. And so I've been blessed to have that example. You know, my dad was, you know, he was not a big name black all-star player. He was the last guy on the bench. You know, he had to be the best at coaching. He had to be the best at what he did. And so, he informed, his, his management style was informed by Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and he was looking at, you know, how did these leaders influence and lead men in a different way, at the same time understanding the game of baseball. And so he knew that he, the way he saw baseball was different than anyone else, and he trusted that. And so I had that example in front of me of watching, you know, because all the, all the way up until I got to FAM, you know, I was, my dad was kind of like a minor league coach. We were a check-to-check -check family. I didn't really, you know, um, 
my dad didn't make it to the big leagues until later, and so I saw his fight and his struggle and how he got to where he got, and I'm blessed to have had that example inform how I go about what I'm doing. Um, and so, yeah, man, my heart is with you not, not having that example, and I, I think that's just one of the, the reasons why I've been able to do what I'm doing, because I, I did have that example in, in front of me and that person to call that I still call on today. I appreciate it, thank you. Okay, over here. Greetings, my name is Jordan Smith. Um, first, I wanna say thank you for not only being an inspiration to black designers, but black men, period. And also, I just wanted to thank you for keeping faith in everything you do when it's a lot of demonic and satanic things going on around us, just keeping the word and faith in all of us. Um, so my question to you is more so, you talked about, you know, your background and how you got to becoming a fashion designer. You talked about, you know, the different collaborations and things that you've done and also how you built the team. Um, as someone who isn't necessarily a fashion designer, but who has a passion for fashion, has been making ways to get to a place where they can help other designers or help people who can drive the product to where it needs to be, what is some inspiration you can, well, what is some advice you can give just from a aspect of being a fashion designer, there's multiple ways to get to it. I, at either way, it's creating product for somebody like me who would rather, you know, work in marketing or work in accounting in for a fashion brand or something like that. What's some advice that you could give? Um, I think it's like, it's really plain and simple. It's, you know, try and get an internship, try and get a foot in the door. You know, when um, when I was looking for a job in baseball out of, out of undergrad, and I wanted to be in marketing and PR, you know, um, when, when I met with a, um, uh, a general manager, thanks to my dad, was able to set up a meeting, but that, you know, he was the GM of the Angels at the time, but didn't have a job for me. <laughs> but he, you know, he said, just, you know, get your foot in the door anywhere. If this is what you want to do, baseball, doesn't matter what department, just get your foot in the door somewhere. And so, you know, there's thousands of fashion brands out there. And don't be afraid to work in the mail room. Don't be afraid to do whatever you got to do if that's where you know you really want to be. Um, and and try and start anywhere and 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 soak up as as much as you can thank you um it just quick um to what you said I, I feel like i have been going in that direction i'm currently working at apb under the uh, the whitaker group and my thing has been not giving up your ideals to get to that point like, I, I'm very black-centric. I have morals, and I, I don't want to compromise them to get to that position. So that's why I, I ask. Yeah, I mean, and that's something that you're going to consistently have to reckon with as you move up and move through. And you, um, you're cognizant of that. Um, if you ever get to a place where you're compromising who you are, that's probably not the best place. But at the same time, a realization of the industry that you want to get into is also important at an early, because you know what we're doing within Fear God is very different than 99% of the brands out there, and so you got to also recognize that too. And and some of that learning is is good, and so um, um, yeah, I think, and that's why it's important to get in there and really understand, is this what I want to do? You know, is this really what I want to do? Um, because that's a, that's, a, that's a good revelation, too. Thank you. Bless you and your family. Thanks. What's up, Mr. Lorenzo? I'm uh, Joaquin Barnett. I'm a second year graphic design scholar from Panama City, Florida. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for being here. Um, you were one of my biggest inspirations for coming here, actually. So seeing you here today is kind of like a full circle moment. But... Um, what is your what is the most difficult and your favorite part of garment creation? That's my question. Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
most difficult is like landing the idea in your head. You know, my favorite part is when that idea hits your head. <laughs> yeah, I guess that makes sense. So it's like favorite is the inspiration and then the hardest part is like landing that idea mm -hmm. or trying to land beyond what you think that idea is. Mm -hmm. But to that point, so much of, of the idea is really in the process. Mm -hmm. It's in the process that you're making mistakes and the mistake looks good and then you're kind of going a different way or you're, you're going, you know what I mean? You're getting informed by the process. So much of design is the process of the work. And so you've, you've got to love that tough part, which is the process. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, over here. And our uh, line greetings. keeps growing, but okay. Greetings, Mr. Lorenzo. I'm Jalen Henderson, a fourth year business administration student from Atlanta, Georgia, and the owner of Solid Clothing. So my uh, question is with fast fashion being very popular and a lot of brands, you know, coming out and just copying what's hot right now. I want to know when you first started, is your vision from when you first started the same? for your brand as it is now. And it's kind of three parts to the question, but you're gonna, I feel like you're gonna be able to flow into it. Um, the second part is where did essentials come from for fear of God and how were you able to position something so simple but the quality is good to maybe who somebody who did the same thing, chose a word and then is doing the same fabric as you, same cutting. How were you able to position yourself to be such a prestige brand over those ones? Um, good question, man. Um... Um, the first question was about fast fashion. It was, yeah, your vision, your vision when you first started to now, as in the style of the clothing, were you always going to make comfortable clothing? I was always going to make comfortable clothing. Like my, what I hated was every time I wanted to dress up, I had to like, you know, put on, you know, a, a, a suit or something that was tighter than the proportion that I wore like the rest of the week. You know, my, my, my point of view is, you know, and if you look at like our tailoring, it's, it's more generous and forgiving. I hate the word baggy, it's not baggy, but it's like, it's relaxed, it's generous, but it's just as sophisticated. And um, I've always wanted to have an effortless feel to what I do, because I think from fashion, as soon as it looks like you're trying to do too much is when it like doesn't look cool. Um, so that's always been kind of my point of view. And then essentials was, Again, I just wanted to create something that was aspirational and still accessible. And for me, I couldn't find like the perfect hoodies that I liked. I couldn't find the perfect sweats. You know, maybe the fabric was too heavy or maybe the it didn't drape the way I wanted it to drape or the heather gray was too cold. <laughs> you know, it's like I just couldn't find exactly what I wanted and then I just felt convicted that if I wanted it, somebody else might. It was kind of really that that symbol and, you know, what what are these basic pieces that, you know, when I want to put on, you know, a Saint Laurent pair of jeans, let's say back in the day, um, that I can rock with that, that can live next to it and not feel like it's cheap, you know? And so Again, it came from what I felt like was a solution in the market. Yes, sir. And one more thing with the positioning. Did you feel that it was your networking, the quality of your clothes, um, where your clothes were at, maybe where you were selling them, that just made it such a big brand to what it is today? It's all of those things, man. You can't, you can't overlook any one of those. They all play a part. Yes, you know, sir. it's not one piece. You know, it's not one piece of the puzzle that... You know, you have to consider every single part of that, you know. And so, um, yeah, we can we consider everything. You know, at the time, the brand was FOG, which was a takedown from Fear of God, and I didn't like it because it felt like a takedown. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I changed it to Essentials, you know, and I wanted it to be something that could live on its own. And um, and was also like it was crazy to me that no one had a brand called Essentials, and if they did, and hadn't been positioned in the right way. And then when the Instagram handle was open, I was like, "Oh, it's gonna be a wrap. We got this." So um, yeah, man, it's just it's a part of it's luck, it's hard work, it's you know. 
again, man, it's, 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 it's everything going into one thing. Um, and you take luck out of it, it doesn't work. You take marketing out of it, it doesn't work. You take, a, you know, the wrong design, it doesn't work. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that all of these pieces have landed. And so now I'm just really conscious of, of the gift and how am I being a, a steward of this? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Over here. Hi, um, my name is Claire Lathan. I'm a third year graphic design major from Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I'd consider, consider myself an interdisciplinary artist. So like I have my own brand and then I also I'm signed with one management in Chicago. Um, I just say in terms of like fashion and kind of like getting to know more about brands and stuff, um, what were like huge fashion brands that inspired you growing up um, a lot, especially um, with like your type of style and I guess your silhouettes, like what brands maybe like that we don't know now um, kind of gave you inspiration? Um, to be honest, I didn't know the brands that I liked until I got older and then started to, to, to realize oh, this blazer, this is like an Armani shape that I really, really like. You know, this kind of like comfortable. But coming up, I didn't know that that's what I liked. I just knew I liked the way that looked. I knew how things looked. And I looked to, you know, a random cat on the set versus like a celebrity or something like that had a cool swag or a cool, you know what I mean? I just was, again, I was open to all different, you know, things to inform my, my point of view. And then as I've gotten older and I start to really define it is when I realized, oh, like I like, I like this guy, I like that guy. You know, I understand what they're saying and I keep going back to like these certain, certain designers. Cool. But I would say one of my favorites is probably Armani. Armani, okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you, all right, over here. Hello, my name is Savion Porter. Well, I am Savion Porter. I'm a first year accounting major from Gary, Indiana. So in your recent interview with Mav Carter, I heard that you also worked with the brand Yeezy at one point. And me as an up and coming fashion designer, I am considering working with another designer, but I also want to be able to keep my vision and my message that I want to portray clear. So how did you do that working with another designer as well? Man, that was the hardest thing in my life. <laughs> I had just started like fear of God and I was trying to find my own point of view mm -hmm. and um, six months to a year after that, you know, I get a call from Ye to come help him mm -hmm. or he wants to meet with me. And then from that one meeting, he said, hey, can you be in Paris, you know, in two weeks to help me with this APC collab? Um, a lot of my point of view went, went, in, went into that and um, that was really hard for me to, hey, what am I gonna give to myself if I'm kind of giving, giving to this? And I called my wife and she just said, well, you know, is that your only idea? Is that your last idea? And I was like, no. She's like, so okay, what are you worried about? You know, and so I looked at it differently. Like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to learn. This is an opportunity for me to learn and to, on a bigger stage, um, through a bigger platform, you know, watch some of my ideas come to life. Mm -hmm. And 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 being blessed to 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 see those ideas come to life and then getting the confidence of okay, it's it's not necessarily the platform, but it's the ideas and understanding that hey I can, you know, I I do have a point of view. And I see how it's taking off in the world in the way that I anticipated. Um, but yeah, that was tough to share some ideas when I was still just trying to find my own point of view. But um, it's all a part of the process, you know. And if right now, you know, um, that's where you're at, I, I would just advise you not to hold back because it's an opportunity to see if you know your ideas are any good or not. You know, if they're going through somewhere, somewhere else, you know, um, and if you got good ideas, you're always going to have good ideas. The ideas are never going to stop. 
Oh, I, I thank your wife for the insight, so she gave it to you. Uh, my, so I have another question as well, all right? So, okay, as I listened to you on stage, one goal or one thought that popped up in my head was that we have a lot of goals, but it's really the person that you become on the journey. And I'm a person willing and ready to learn. So I'm here to ask you, from you personally or your company, are you guys offering any opportunities or mentorships or internships that a young creative as myself can be involved in? No, I mean, I think, you know, immediately speaking, no. I think my, my heart's desire after making it back here for the first time um, is really going to expedite us creating a, a platform to, um, to provide um, a look behind the curtain and a chance for, um, for people to come and learn. Um, to be honest, man, it's my first time back. I've been so focused on, on you know, getting this thing to where, you know, to where it's at. Um, and now that I've, you know, slowed some things down to, to, to reprioritize, you know, what's really important to me, um, providing those opportunities is something that um, we're going to do sooner than later. Um, but it's just, you know, taken me to go so far to then, like, kind of pull back. Um, but immediately speaking, no, but in the near future, yes. Okay. Thank you. My name is Savion Porter for when, when uh, you know, future events come on. <laughs> okay, I got, my, I got my team members in here. They can write, write it down. <laughs> All right, so let me say this. Mr. Lorenzo has been very generous with his time. We're going to take one more question because we have gotten more people walking up, and, but I also um, got to start wrapping this up, so we're going to take one more question. Um, greetings, I am Daniel Johnson, a second year business administration scholar from Broward County, Florida. And first and foremost, I just want to say um, thank you for just, you know, being gracious with your time and all the wisdom that you've given us tonight. And um, my first question is, um, I recently heard a quote that said, people are only as good as the systems and the routines that they have set in, set in place. And my first, my question is, um, when you were first starting, not even just fear of God itself, but like learning how to design, what did your daily routine look like at that time when it came to like bettering your craft? Oh man, I mean, when I first started, I, you know, it was different. It was, I wanted to make a t-shirt and so I had to learn that there was no blanks that were exactly what I wanted. Then I had to learn how to make a pattern, then how to make the t-shirt, then find the fabric and I learned that, oh, okay, this person that makes the pattern and makes the sample isn't the same as the company that's going to produce it. And so and then I had to go find a production company that would do quantities that I needed. Um, it's been something so, you know, small and my, in, in the minutia every time that as it's growing, it's, you know, it's always something new, you know, and your, your, your day is just, evolving as, as, as you're evolving. Mm -hmm. um, but again, um, I remember making that first t-shirt and doing like 20 rounds and this guy's like, yo, you're spending so much money on the same pattern. I'm like, yeah, but it's not right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I, again, coming back here and, you know, remember, you know, running from, which was like Palmetto or something down there all the way up you know, past the the the, the um, railroad tracks and all the way back to like the baseball field and like running in the rain and like, it's like, oh, okay, you, you've been going hard. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until, you know, I get back here and realize, wow, like this is given back to me. And so um, each day is gonna be different, but again, how you give to each of those days is what's gonna, def <laughs> what's gonna define like what your future days look like. Okay, and um, I'm sorry, last question. Um, as a person who's creative in different fields, specifically in terms of music production, rapping, and design, I find myself pulling inspiration from many different sources. And in regards to fashion, my main like three inspirations are you, Kanye West, and Virgil Abloh. And one thing I kind of struggle with is kind of finding my own lane and finding my own style within my design journey so far. So I wanted to ask, um, 
How long did it take for you to find your own style of designing and different, dif differentiate yourself from those who inspired you? Um, that's a really good question. I think if you look at the three of us, like our perspectives are really different. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think the lie is that, that there's only room for a few of us. Mm -hmm. And we have to stop believing that there's only room for a few black perspectives in fashion when every other perspective in fashion is not ours. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, ours may have been a little similar, but the reality was they were very different. And everyone here has a perspective and everyone's perspective is valid. Um, and again, your point of view is what makes room for you. Mm -hmm. you. You can't, if that's your point of view, then stand by your point of view. I could care less if it looks like what somebody else might have just did. That's what I believe in it. You know, I'm not looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it came out looking similar than it is what it is, but I know what I'm doing. And that also allows you to continue to do like what you're doing is you have a vision and an understanding of what your perspective is. Um, when you're looking around with the intention to be different for the sake of being different, it's not a strong enough it's not a strong enough um, purpose to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you, just being you is, is going to qualify you. And that's, what, again, like you gotta find out who you are. Once you know who you are, like now, like it's, it's the opportunities are uncapped. If you're just trying to be different than what's out there right now, that's, that's a capped potential for what you're doing. If you're trying to be the best version of yourself, there's, there's no cap on that. All right. Thank you so much. Excuse me. I just had one question. No, I'm sorry. I'm I have been. Of, sorry. So, I want to Shante. thank. Yes. We got a presentation over here. Yes. <laughs> Good. I'll let you finish. Yes. So, we are very excited and very thankful to Mr. Lorenzo. Um, he may be able to take a few questions when we Can come out. Can you call me Jerry? Okay, Jerry. <laughs> you know, you're coming back to campus, so we got to give you a little props. I'm just I know saying. I'm old, but this No, you're Jerry not as old cool. as me, so you good. But anyway, um, one of my students wanted me to give you this. It's his gift to you. He does design, so Mr. Felix, and so I'm going to leave that with you. Um, but before we um, actually close out, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Donald Palm, who is our chief operating officer, to um, bring this to a close. First of all, let's give uh, Jerry a round of applause. I um, want to thank you for this very informative and inspirational black history conversation. And sir, I don't know how old you are, but man, you dropped some wisdom tonight, man. Um, you dropped some words of wisdom. We'll call him the Book of Jerry, because <laughs> bro, <laughs> really, really great wisdom tonight. Uh, just in general, um, your career trajectory from the baseball diamond and classes in SBI and the School of Journalism and Graphic Communications to the pantheons of global fashion industry is another example that you can get anywhere from Florida A&M University. And so if you don't mind, why don't you come forward and I'll bring um, our facilitator, uh, Oprah, I mean, Shante <laughs> Friday Strout to the forefront. We have a, a plaque that we want to give you. Uh, it's the President's Award, and again, Dr. Robinson apologized. He had another uh, uh, event that he had to get to, but it says, the President's Award presented to Jerry Lorenzo Emanuel. Uh, alumnus and founder of Fear of God for serving as a keynote panelist for the 2024 Black History Month conversation presented this 20th day of February 2024, Dr. Larry Robinson, President. Also, again, I want to also talk about his career reflects the truism that our graduates leave the highest of seven hills with much more than a college degree. They leave with a purpose, confidence, and a drive to break barriers to make the improbable achievable. Tonight, we heard Jerry talk about his journey, his passion, his aha moment, and lessons he has learned. We hope that they are beneficial to you. Imagine 
what it will take for you to be invited back to be the special guest for Florida A&M University's Black History Month conversation. The reservation is open. Thank you for joining us this evening, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Um, if any of you all are creatives or fashion designers or anything in that realm, I would love to get y'all contact information. Thank y'all.